Hello everyone and uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Rachit and I'm part of Taxman's research and advisory team. I'll be hosting today's webinar and it's a great uh, pleasure for me to introduce our speakers today, Mr. Raghav Bajaj and uh, Mr. Omkar Sharma, who will be presenting on today's webinar on taxation and regulatory issues of cryptocurrencies. Mr. Bajaj is principal associate in the direct tax practice group of Ketan and Company. He specializes in matters relating to tax dispute resolution, transfer pricing, international tax, and advises clients in relation to tax efficient restructuring of inbound and outbound investments, tax due diligence, transactional tax matters, and treaty tax analysis related aspects. He focuses extensively on cryptocurrencies and the underlying blockchain technology. Raghav was selected as Inter-Pacific Bar Association IPBA Scholar for the year 2017 to attend the IPBA Annual Conference at Auckland. He was also named in the World Transfer Pricing Rankings. In academics, Raghav has secured All India ranks in CA and CS examinations. He is a regular contributor of, of articles, write-ups for professional magazines and journals. And he also regularly speaks at various webinars and seminars. Our second speaker on the subject is Mr. Omkar Sharma. Mr. Sharma is principal associate uh, with India tax, tax team of Ketan and Company. He is a law graduate from uh, Gujarat National Law University and he specializes in indirect in tax including GST. He has an experience of over 10 years in aiding, advising and representing multinationals and Indian companies before various indirect tax forums and the honorable High Courts and the Supreme Court of India. He has recently been involved in structuring of transactions concerning cryptocurrencies and NFTs and assessing indirect tax implications. So uh, just a little note to attendees before we get started. Uh, you have, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. Uh, your queries will be taken in Q&A session at the end of webinar. So over to you, Raghaji now. Thank you, Rachit. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session on cryptocurrencies, something which has become the talk of the town. Uh, it seems like almost every day there is a big and interesting development in this space. For example, recently El Salvador, the South American country, became the first country in the world to recognize Bitcoin as legal tender. Uh, the number of businesses that have started accepting payments in cryptos is slowly increasing. Uh, now we have, uh, we have been reading about talks uh, gaining momentum about India's very own official digital currency, which is popularly known as, you know, central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. And amidst all this, when people started developing some knowledge about cryptos, we now have a new menace to decode that is non-fungible tokens or NFTs. The whole debate about its legality, whether cryptocurrencies should be banned or regulated has also added a lot of fuel to the fire. But the uh, large question is, is it a bubble or does it have some other uses also? Which industries will be affected by this? Does it have anything of relevance for lawyers, professionals, chartered accountants? So in today's session, what we will do, we will try to decode cryptos and venture into areas like what is cryptocurrency, um, the evolving legal landscape, are crypto earnings taxable? What is the underlying technology behind cryptos? Who all are investing in cryptocurrencies? During the session, we will have some polls coming up on the screen. Do participate in them. That will help us in collecting information for further research and uh, you know keep the session engaging also. Once the poll goes live, you can participate in that by using the poll window on the right side of your screen. With professional firms beefing up their practice areas in this field, uh, I think it is an opportune time for all of us to have, number one, at least a working knowledge of this concept, uh, and number two, an overview of this ecosystem. In fact, it seems like fresh talents are also looking for places which can give them exposure to such fields. So as a first poll, just uh, have you ever invested in cryptocurrencies? And they can be, of course, a yes and no. But the third option, very interesting, is that, oh, yes, I wanted to do, but uh, did not invest due to the lack of clarity. And as we can see, we have a mixed uh, response. So the majority right now is in uh, that most people have not invested, but there is a decent amount of persons who said that, you know, I wanted to invest, but uh, did, not, did not invest due to lack of clarity. So what it does, at least it gives us some un uh, some understanding of the audience that people have, uh, have some interest, have some craze, and they wanted to invest in this. 
Now, uh, with this background, if we move, so the so the first uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, uh, that gained traction after the 2008 financial crisis when a person wrote a paper about peer-to-peer -peer electronic transactions. Uh, what this paper did, it stated that if one person wanted to transfer money to another person, uh, he should be able to do this transaction directly without there being a need for a common trusted party like a bank. And the question is, why so? Why do you want to remove the banks? Uh, that's because number one, there is an inherent cost attached with the banking system. And number two, banking system has suffered from many financial failures in the past. Another aspect where cryptos score above the centrally regulated currencies lies in the fact that with paper currency, uh, if central banks and governments keep on printing more money, obviously the value of money would go down in our hands. On the other hand, the value of a cryptocurrency lies in the hands of its users, just like gold. Uh, now, what started as a phenomenon to revolutionize the uh, financial system led to the existence of more than 5,000 cryptocurrencies and everyone trying to be the next multi-billion dollar asset. Of course, Bitcoin, Ethereum, these are the most popular ones. Uh, in fact, with Bitcoin valuations moving from $10,000 to $65,000 in, in less than a year, uh, again going down to $30,000 and then again coming up to $50,000, undoubtedly there is a lot of hype in this arena. If I talk about numbers, the market cap of cryptos is $2 trillion. That is about 150 lakh crore rupees. Uh, to put this into context, this is equal to the market cap of global giants like Apple, Microsoft, Google. Uh, at a domestic level, this is much more than the combined market cap of top listed companies in India. Uh, only around 10 countries in the world have GDPs, which is higher than this. But the question is, does this number have any other significance? So if we talk from an income tax perspective, this also provides a huge tax opportunity for countries. Because if we apply a very basic tax rate of 20%, uh, the global tax opportunity for this asset class comes to $400 billion. That is about 30 lakh crore rupees. And out of this, India's crypto market can also add around 60,000 crore rupees easily to government's tax kitty. Hence, uh, while from a regulatory perspective, uh, perspective, we know that governments are grappling with you know, major issues regarding the legal roadmap for cryptos. All such policy decisions which will be taken in uh, future should, uh, should be tested from the prism of tax opportunity also. If we talk about industrial applications, um, the underlying blockchain technology has the potential to disrupt many industries and businesses. Uh, for example, industries like banking, insurance, financial services are some of the key industries which have already started exp uh, you know, exploring business case opportunities from this field. In fact, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum are now being regarded not just as an asset class, but as a revolutionary digital infrastructure on which apps and other products are going to be developed in future. Uh, let, me, let me put it different. If uh, today when we use the internet, do we know which transatlantic fiber cable is being used? Or uh, do we even care about that? No, right? We just use the technology. So what the stakeholders of these cryptocurrencies are saying is that in future, we will be using products and apps that will be based on this technology. And perhaps we won't even be aware of that. And that's the beauty of fintech. Now, the, the second poll question is, which country tops the crypto ownership list in terms of the percentage of the total population? And the options are there in front of you, US, UK, India, France, Nigeria, Germany. And you'll see that all the countries are those countries which are sort of big in their respective continents. Now, in terms of ownership trends around the world, the first and foremost point to note is that in terms of uh, in the in past year, the global cryptocurrency adoption rate grew by over 800%. And that is a big jump by any standards. Uh, but if we talk about percentage of total population, surprisingly, it is not countries like US, UK, uh, India, China, Germany, Japan, France, which tops the list. Uh, the list toppers are countries like Nigeria, Vietnam, Philippines. Uh, the next question is what about in terms of absolute numbers? Well, in that list, undoubtedly, India tops the charts. And this is where in the past few years, uh, what has happened is that India's biggest problem, that is the ever exploding population bubble, has started becoming its biggest asset. Because now, for every industrial application, India is regard India's uh, biggest for India's population is has become its asset like a market. If we talk about some uh, domestic uh, trends in India, uh, let's see which Indian cities will uh, are having you know higher growth rates in terms of new user signups on crypto uh, crypto platforms. Are more and more people coming from metro cities or more and more people are coming from non metro cities? As we can see right now, the poll uh, 
the view is sort of uh, tilting in, in favor of metros around 60% of the uh, attendees feel that the metro cities are leading and around 30% feel that it is the non metros uh, so there can be different reasons also uh, i mean there are uh, a non metro person can have more uh, i mean the non metro people can have sign up uh, can be signing up on the crypto platforms for different reasons whereas the persons from metro cities can sign up on the crypto platforms for different reasons so in terms of indian trends in terms of city wise demographics uh, opposite to what the audience view is the growth rate in non metro cities has surged in the past 12 months uh, in fact crypto platforms have reported excellent growth rates in terms of new user signups from non metro cities and the percentage of people the new uh, users who are signing up on platforms from the non metro cities is higher from, uh, than the people who are signing up from the metro cities in terms of age understandably the younger population outnumbers the elderly colleagues uh, data shows that the majority participation comes from 25 to 40 year olds in terms of gender the data is skewed in favor of males but of uh, but the growth rate in terms of in the in terms of female users is also very impressive now since the concept of cryptocurrencies is relatively new to the world there are bound to be some interesting facts uh, on the screen we have put some points and there's a poll which which has gone live now uh, one of these events is false it could uh, you have to guess which one of these is false it could be either the tesla point uh, that tesla owns bitcoins worth 2 billion dollars uh, lionel messi uh, is being paid some part of his fees in psgs that is the football club uh, in uh, psgs crypto tokens uh, other option could be that the electricity consumption in cryptocurrency mining is higher other option could be uh, the donation of shiba inu tokens then there is an option on pizza purchase by uh, cryptocurrency bitcoin and there is a last option that uh crypto earnings are taxable as you can see right now the, and one of these events is false so you have to guess the false event right now as i can see the uh, poll is going more in favor of the last option that you have to uh, that you will have to pay taxes on your crypto gains so surprisingly the answer is the pizza option but the incorrectness is not in the fact that uh, uh, that this sort of a transaction never happened this sort of a transaction happened but the incorrect part was the number of bitcoins which were used so in 2010 a person used 10000 bitcoins to purchase two pizzas um, the value of those 10000 bitcoins would have been around 500 million dollars today and i think that's why people generally say that you know uh, junk food is not good for your health uh, not just your physical health but also your financial health another interesting aspect is that the term that we have been using to denote this asset class is not the most appropriate one so what we have done on the screen we have put a diagram from a report by oecd uh, this diagram shows the evolution in the terminology which has been used by various governments and regulators around the world in their official publications and statements when they want to refer to this asset class so initially if you if you see bitcoin and cryptocurrency were used interchangeably just like the word xerox is used for photocopying and, uh, and you know the word jeep is used for some suvs generally in fact in the earlier years more than 50% official publications used the term bitcoin only and if uh, you will see that all the official publications and statements which uh, started coming from the year 2013 14 most of them were using the term bitcoin only but later on as awareness about this ecosystem increased governments and regulators realized that uh, bitcoin is just one type of a crypto token hence they started using the expression virtual currency and as you can see the expression virtual currency increased from being used in around 40% official publications in 2013 to nearly 80% in 2016 of course today while there are other expressions also like crypto asset digital currency uh, virtual asset but the general consensus is, uh, amongst the governments and regulators is that virtual currency is the more widely used expression when it comes to their official publications and statements now with this background uh, now we have a, a, a decent background about why cryptocurrencies came into picture why or why is there all all the recent hype about uh, around the crypto token ecosystem let us understand what exactly are the apprehensions or concerns of regulators in term in relation to cryptos and why do people still like this asset class so the first and the foremost apprehension of course comes from the fact that crypto valuations are highly volatile what this means is that if one crypto token is worth 100 when you sleep uh, it may reduce to 80 when you wake up and that is one major concern if one were to characterize these tokens as currency because the value of currency cannot go for a toss like this 
Secondly, since these tokens are not issued by a government or regulator, they seem to venture into areas you know which are earmarked for central agencies. The third concern is about the potential usage in illicit activities. And, and this is mainly because cryptos were used in the initial years for some illicit activities also. Then we have the environmental impact point because cryptocurrency mining consumes enormous amounts of electricity. Hence, from that perspective also, regulators and governments have their concerns because, I mean, cryptocurrency mining is not a green-friendly activity. Recently, Iran banned cryptocurrency mining during summer because of the enormous electricity consumption. If we talk about uh, from the investor's perspective, definitely the possibility of massive returns on investment is perhaps the biggest reason why a common man would want to enter into this arena. Uh, the COVID-induced hunger for alternative investments also gave a big push to crypto tokens. And that is why it is being regarded as digital gold. Because just like gold is limited in supply, so are crypto tokens. From a more use case perspective, stakeholders are saying that, you know, crypto tokens can make micro transactions possible. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, that means that activities like viewing web pages on the internet can also be monetized for as low as one pesa per page. While this is possible in the current setup also, uh, there's no there's no stoppage for that. But the transaction costs that are involved in this uh, make it unfeasible. And then perhaps the biggest counter by crypto stakeholders is that if the regulators have any apprehension or concern, they should just regulate it and not ban it. So let me give another example. Uh, we know that with vehicles moving on roads, accidents are inevitable. But does it mean that uh, you ban road traffic? No, rather you regulate it by putting speed controls, safety protocols, the same thing can apply to net banking. We know that people that with more and more people coming on net banking, uh, online frauds are bound to happen. But how do you control? You don't ban net banking. You just regulate it by, you know, um, putting extra safety protocols, uh, multi-level uh, authentication methods. And that's how that's how you regulate it. So the crypto stakeholders are saying that if there are any apprehensions or concerns, don't just ban it, but regulate it. And I think that's the moot question to be answered here. Do you ban it? Or can you achieve the same objective by just regulating it? Uh, and in fact, if we talk about the character, uh, let me ask one question here uh, as the next poll. Uh, what before we, before we move to the uh, you know characterization point? What do you think is the most appropriate characterization? Because after this slide, we'll move to the we'll discuss the characterization aspects. But let's see what the audience feels right now. Which is the most appropriate characterization? Should it be money or currency or should it be uh, security or intangible asset or commodity or goods? Or do you think that it should be all of the above? Because there is no stoppage right now. Right now, what is happening? Everything is just uh, every uh, the regulators are grappling with the point. How do you characterize it? So right now, as, as we can see the OK, so it's a mixed classification. Goods is getting only 1%. 29% people are saying that it should be all of the above, but there is a decent 25% intangible asset, 18% uh, commodity. So this is a good, I mean, this, so, and as we can see the, since we are also not able to make out, a, uh, we don't have a complete consensus. That's the problem with regulators are also having. In fact, characterization of cryptocurrencies is one of the most burning questions. Uh, governments, regulators across different ju ju jurisdictions are having a tough time to recognize this asset class. Because how do you characterize them, whether it is an asset or a means of payment or currency? And let me tell you, this uh, determination is significant not only from a regulatory perspective, but from a tax perspective also. Uh, though the most common uh, approach seems that it is indeed an asset, the next obvious question is what type of asset? Is it an intangible asset? Is it a good? Is it a security? Is it a commodity? In fact, the OECD report in relation to cryptocurrencies notes that while majority countries consider them as intangible assets, uh, a decent number of countries also consider them as commodities or financial assets or foreign fiat currency. Uh, the report also noted that when it comes to accounting treatment, even though there is no formal guidance which is available, the International Financial Reporting Interpretations Committee, which is popularly known as the IFRIC, uh, that notes that virtual currencies do meet the definition of intangible assets under the applicable accounting standards. Then the question of currency or money, and that is a very important question. Now, that question is still not free from doubt. And I'll tell you why. Uh, that's because currency needs to have some basic attributes. Number one, it should be a unit of account. Uh, what do I mean by that? It should be a standard of unit of measurement uh, of the value of goods and services. 
So for example, if you see any Indian company's financial statements, you will note that they are drawn up in INR. Similarly, a laptop may be worth 50,000 rupees, a phone may be worth 60,000 rupees. Second, it should be a store of value. What do I mean by that? Currency is something in which value can be stored. Uh, for example, if you work at an organization and receive 100 rupees as remuneration, it means that those 100 rupees act as the store of your value. Other examples could be investments like gold, real estate, stocks. Number three, it should be a means of exchange. Uh, that means that currency is an intermediary instrument or system or lubricant which is used to facilitate the sale, purchase or trade of goods between parties. Uh, number fourth, it should be recognized as a legal tender. Hence, what, what is happening when someone invests in a cryptocurrency today, what that person is basically doing, it is using that asset as a store of value. Interestingly, in the Supreme Court judgment last year, which we'll discuss in the coming slides, which was a landmark judgment in the field of cryptocurrencies, uh, though the RBI and crypto platforms took a similar stand that cryptocurrencies are neither currency nor money, uh, the Apex Court concluded that it cannot be said that cryptos, uh, cryptos are just goods or commodities and that it can never be regarded as real money. So that was an interesting conclusion which came from that judgment. Hence, it will be interesting to wait how the government deals with this, uh, deals with this issue and if it if at all it comes with the crypto bill which is being talked about uh, lately in the in the media how how does that bill characterize crypto cryptocurrencies in future with this background i'll request my colleague onkar to you know talk about the characterization like and the fame aspects also in relation to cryptos onkar over to you hi thank you raghav for such an insightful overview of cryptocurrencies i'm sure you would have cleared a lot of doubts and rumors surrounding cryptocurrencies now, good afternoon to all our attendees. In this segment of webinar, I shall make an attempt to lay down the regulatory framework pertaining to cryptocurrencies and would specifically deal with the characterization of cryptocurrencies. Post that, I would also touch upon the interface between cryptocurrency and FEMA or the Foreign Management Exchange Act. So first and foremost question when we talk about characterization of cryptocurrency is whether it can be said to be legal tender or money or would it get classified as goods or a medium of payment? Or since it is traded over exchanges, would it get classified as securities? So there has been a lot of discussion surrounding the nature of cryptocurrencies and whether it is acceptable or legally recognized as medium of payment or not. While some of the countries have tried to ascertain the nature, most of the countries are still grappling with this issue, including India. Even countries where this treatment has been finalized they have also gone through the same challenges which we are facing as of now. So getting on with the characterization of the cryptocurrency, first reference can be made to the Foreign Exchange Management Act or FEMA. Now FEMA provides for an inclusive definition of the term currency. Section 222H, it defines currency to include all currency notes, postal notes, postal orders, money orders, checks, drafts, Traveler's checks, letter of credit, bills of exchange and promissory notes, credit cards or such similar instrument as may be notified by the RBI. So these are those kind of instruments which we use in our day to day life. Now, further, the term currency notes has been defined under clause 2 I to mean and include cash in form of coins and banks notes. If we see all these categories which has been provided under this definition, then with certainty we can say that cryptocurrency in its present form does not meet either of these heads, nor it has been notified by RBI to be a currency. Therefore, the only two categories are left is whether it gets classified as coins or banks notes. Now, in order to ascertain that, we will have to look at the definition of coin. Coin has been defined under the Coinage Act, wherein it means any coin which is made of metal or any other material stamped by the central government. So it has to be issued by the central government. Therefore, again, since cryptocurrency is something which is not issued by the central government, it gets ruled out. Similar is the case in terms of bank's note. Again, bank note are something under the RBI Act, Section 22 of the RBI Act, which are issued by the RBI. Again, cryptocurrency is not being issued by the RBI, leave apart being issued, not being recognized by RBI. It cannot qualify as bank notes. So 
all those terminologies which we you know hear immediately upon thinking of cryptocurrency like currency coin notes these all gets ruled out in the context of india now therefore coming to other terminologies which fema uses now first is foreign exchange fema defines foreign exchange as foreign currency under section 2n as a currency other than an indian currency so it has to be currency therefore one interpretation says that since it is not a currency so therefore it does not qualify as a foreign currency and thereby not a foreign exchange under fema however there is a second school of thought on this which says that currency under rbi uh, currency for the purpose of fema is defined something which is recognized by rbi or falls under those terminologies what about currencies which are recognized by other countries like raghav mentioned in the previous segment that it has now been recognized by one of the countries el salvador now they recognize it as a legal tender then what happens in such case the act does not answer this question so there is a varied interpretation this is a gray area under fema wherein we cannot say anything with certainty however since rbi is opposed to the idea of recognizing cryptocurrency as any form of currency or medium of exchange or payment towards anything therefore it will be difficult in the present setup for us us to qualify it as a foreign currency and fema now this second terminology which fema uses is foreign securities now what is foreign security it is any security in the form of shares stocks bonds debentures or any other in instrument denominated or expressed in foreign currency and include securities expressed in foreign currency but where redemption or any form of return such as interest or dividends is payable in indian currency again neither of these criteria are satisfied also let's look at the definition of securities securities defined under the securities contract regulation act under section 2h it says what are it says securities are shares scripts stocks bonds debentures debenture stock or other marketable securities of a like nature it also encapsulates derivatives units or other instruments issued by any collective investment scheme like mutual fund schemes government securities or such other instruments as may be declared by the central government to be securities so very specific items are listed under the definition of security which qualifies as securities again since there is no central since the central government does not declare this particular instrument even if we call cryptocurrencies as instrument the central government does not declare it as securities hence it would not qualify as securities and essentially meaning thereby it does not get qualified as foreign security as well so therefore none of these categories which are mentioned in fema are applicable to cryptocurrencies with certainty therefore how do we categorize or how do we classify cryptocurrency as the next test can be on the basis of its uses as raghav was stating earlier that presently cryptocurrencies are being used for settling various kind of payments most recent being payment received by messi from psg so can in under the indian framework of law we say that cryptocurrency is a medium of payment whether would it qualify as a payment instrument now to a certain that reference needs to be made to the payment and settlement systems act wherein section 21i defines the term payment system as a system that enables payment to be effected between a payer and beneficiary involving clearing payment or settlement service or all of them but does not include a stock exchange and includes the system enabling credit card operation debit card operation smart card operation money transfer operation or similar operations now section 18 of the payment settlement act empowers rbi to regulate issuance of payment system so again rbi is a regulating authority here and accordingly being a regulator the rbi has issued master direction on issuance and operation of prepaid payment instruments on october 11 2017 wherein they said prepaid payment instrument as payment instrument that facilitates purchase of goods and services includes fund transfer against value stored on such instruments now if we analyze the characteristic of cryptocurrency then there is no exact value which is stored in them 
the value of a cryptocurrency depends upon the demand and supply in the market, in the cryptocurrency market, which keeps on fluctuating. So you, you will see that it does not only fluctuate, it fluctuates within a great range. So, so it cannot be termed as a prepaid payment instrument because the value is stored on a prepaid payment instrument is constant. It has a fixed number. So say today uh, you want to make some purchases through your credit card. So you know what is the maximum limit which you can spend from this card. So whenever you make an expense, you know what is the value of that expense. It does not fluctuate. So therefore, again, this is a gray area and cryptocurrency may not qualify as a prepaid instrument. Since most of the categories, you know, gets ruled out or is a gray area. The one thing which we are left is whether it is can be treated as goods. Now, there is a landmark Supreme Court judgment which can be referred to in this regard, which talks about property. Raghav was mentioning that this might get categorized as an intangible property. So therefore, we need to understand what a property is. It says, the Supreme Court says, the property includes everything that has an extendable value. It includes the item in question and all rights and liabilities associated with it. An element which is material to the expression when we talk about the terminology property is ownership. While property has all the interest in it, it is the ownership that lets the owner to exercise such interest. And where the interest extends to doing everything, an owner is capable of exercising his right of doing anything and everything with that. Then it is said that he can he has a right in that property. Now, when we talk about this property, it's definitely a movable, it's not an immovable property. That is for sure. So something which is not immovable is a more movable property. And since we do not have any tangible form which is associated with cryptocurrency, it can be said to be an intangible movable property. Now, whether this intangible movable property qualifies as goods or not. So the foremost act which comes to our mind when we talk about goods is the sales of goods act. Now, section 27 of the sales of goods act, it defines the term goods to mean every kind of movable property other than actionable claims and money. And it includes stocks and shares. Growing crops, grass and things attached to or forming part of the land which are agreed to be served, severed before sale or under the contract of sale. More movable property has been defined under section 3 clause 36 of the General Clauses Act. Wherein movable property means property of every description, description except immovable property. What is an immovable property? Immovable property is said to include land, benefits arising out of lands and things attached to earth or permanently fastened to anything that is attached to earth. So like earlier I was saying, therefore the immovable property category completely gets ruled out. It is nothing but a, gets classified as nothing but a movable property, which gets covered by the definition of goods. This particular interpretation that it is goods also gets fortified by its treatment under the Goods and Services Tax Act, the GST Act. Now there, Section 2, Subclause 52 of the CGST Act defines goods to mean every kind of mobile property other than money and securities. So, like we have concluded, and even there are various judgments of the very of high courts and Supreme Court, wherein they have said that an intangible property would qualify as goods. And therefore, under the CGST Act, it qualifies as goods. And since this is not a movable property, immovable property, it gets qualified as movable property. Therefore, for the purpose of GST, what can be said is that cryptocurrency would qualify as goods. Now, this is for the purpose of GST. GST. Every statute has its own framework. So, when we categorize cryptocurrencies, we need to give due regard to the wordings of the statute and the definition mentioned provided therein so that we arrive at the correct categorization. Now, in India, till date, we do not have any, any one single law 
wherein a specific treatment has been provided to cryptocurrencies. Though there is a discussion that a bill might be tabled in the winter session of the parliament, given the present framework of law, we need to categorize cryptocurrency as per the statute under which we seek a particular treatment. Now, moving on to the next slide. Now, let's see how cryptocurrencies can be treated under FEMA. Again, as I earlier mentioned, there is no specific treatment which has been accorded to cryptocurrencies till date under any of the laws. RBI attempted to place certain restrictions, but the Supreme Court overruled those restrictions. But still, a specific law with respect to cryptocurrency has not been framed. So when I say that we are going to see how cryptocurrencies can be treated under a particular framework of law, be it FEMA, be it GST or be it the Income Tax Act. Here we are just trying to attempt to give it a particular classification or categorization or a treatment. The jurisprudence regarding the same is wide and open and we will have to see in the coming days as to how the law evolves in respect of this. Now under FEMA, given that cryptocurrencies may get classified as an intangible mover property, any purchase or sale between a person resident in India and a person resident outside India would get classified either as an import or export transaction. Therefore, under FEMA, secondly, apart from import and export transaction, under FEMA, there are again two other categories under which a particular transaction gets classified. Either it gets classified as a capital account transaction or a current account transaction. Now, Section 2E of the FEMA defines capital account transactions as transactions which alters the assets or liabilities, including contingent liabilities outside India of persons resident in India or liabilities in India of person resident outside in India and include transactions referred to in so-and-so section. Now, in case of purchase of cryptocurrency, by the buyer from a person resident outside India. So if I'm purchasing it from someone on say on a exchange located outside India, where, because once you are buying it from exchange, you won't get to know as to who is the person who is transferring that, or who is making that transfer. So let's assume that we are buying it from a person who is not resident in India, basically a person located outside India. Now, in such cases, the cryptocurrency gets transferred into the wallet of the buyer as in the Indian resident and he will have the exclusive right over such cryptocurrency. In such a case, the location of the cryptocurrency for all legal purposes will be India. Therefore, the purchase of cryptocurrency does not alter the assets and liabilities outside India of the buyer. And accordingly, purchase of cryptocurrency by the buyer who is resident in India does not fall under capital and the category of capital account transaction. Similarly, in case of sale of cryptocurrency by a seller to a person resident outside India on a similar principle, it does not alter the assets or liabilities outside India of the seller. And accordingly, that also cannot be said to be a capital account transaction. So the question is whether it gets classified as a current account transaction. So let's have a look at the definition of the current account transaction. Section 2J of FEMA defines what are current account transaction. And it says that it includes A. A is relevant. Rest other categories are not very relevant for the purpose of this discussion. So I will only restrict myself to A. It says payments due in connection with foreign trade, other current business services, and short-term banking and credit facilities in the ordinary course of business. And various other, now, when we talk about foreign trade, so the important point to note here is it covers payments due in connection with foreign trade. And since it is a, and then, so, so if we look at that, there are three category of transaction which can take place. One, purchase of cryptocurrency from a person resident outside India through a foreign exchange, say a Binance wherein we 
purchase the cryptocurrency by payment of fiat currencies such as usd to a person who is resident outside india this is category 1 category 2 is payment of cryptocurrencies to person resident outside india for purchasing goods or services or procuring services so as you have seen many you know there are payments which people are nowadays making making by through cryptocurrencies earlier there was also news that even one of the big fours they were accepting cryptocurrencies for the services being rendered by them so these are second category of transactions where you buy goods and services by uses of cryptocurrency the third category is payment by cryptocurrency to person resident outside india in consideration for acquiring other cryptocurrencies so basically you acquire a, a bitcoin by payment through ethereum or vice versa that is the third category now there, therefore any of these payment made or received in connection with purchase or sale transactions of by uses of cryptocurrencies or of cryptocurrencies by an indian resident with a person resident outside india under all the three categories will therefore be considered as payment made or received in lieu of a foreign trade and thereby come under the purview of current account transaction so therefore the trades or the transactions which we enter into by uses of cryptocurrency would qualify as current account transaction and not as capital account transaction now therefore what is the problem which we face under fema it seems all bed of roses still here but now the actual problem arises the problem is due to the fact that cryptocurrency is not still treated as a legal tender in india as we have seen above under fema itself it cannot with certainty get categorized under any of those categories which we saw earlier and hence the problem is that it might not get recognized as a mechanism of making payment and receiving payments in india now receipt of payment and making of payment this is governed by the foreign exchange management manner of receipt and payment regulation 2016 that prescribes for the mode of payments in case of import transactions it says that the acceptable mode of payments for imports are one payment made in a currency appropriate to the current country of shipment of goods b payment made in foreign exchange through an international card held in or in rupees from international credit card debit card through the credit debit card servicing bank in india against the charge slip signed by the importer or prescribed by rbi from time to time again the rbi is the regulator provided that the transaction is in conformity with the extant provisions including the foreign trade policy now cryptocurrency does not find mention under any of these now also also because of the fact that cryptocurrencies are not covered under the term foreign exchange it can be informed that in case of any imports made by person resident in india or an indian resident the cap payment cannot be made in cryptocurrency under the aforesaid regulations therefore for making payment further further if you see the those regulations further then for making payment in any other mode other than those those prescribed prior approval of rbi is required and given the history which we have with rbi in, in relation to cryptocurrency it is unlikely that rbi will ever give you an approval to make payment in terms of cryptocurrency so again this is a gray area when we we cannot make payment against the imports being made by us and as stated earlier any transaction through a cryptocurrency can either be a import or an export under fema now when we talk about export then regulation 2 clause 2 of the payment regulation provide that the payments against export transaction shall be received in the following terms one currency appropriate to the final destination two any other mode of receipt as prescribed by rbi again since it is not recognized as a legal tender in india nor it is recognized as a payment mode by rbi you cannot be paid for the export proce export proceeds therefore it seems to be highly restrictive fema seems to be highly restrictive when we talk about cryptocurrencies to the extent that even if we say that it is goods if 
cryptocurrencies are gets qualified as goods then exchange for a good or services or say exchange for a cryptocurrency between or exchange between two cryptocurrencies rather would qualify as barter goods against goods or services against goods it will qualify as barter but the problem is the fema management export of goods and services regulation 2015 which do not permit barter with a foreign resident so so therefore fema seems to be highly restrictive in these sense and not only the characterization of cryptocurrency but the legality of cryptocurrencies is also under scrutiny now since you would have been bored listening to me at one go i would invite my colleague raghav to take you through the global and indian positions regarding the legality of cryptocurrencies raghav over to you thank you ankur no i don't think uh, anyone would have go- uh, got bored i think oh, absolutely interesting and so many new perspectives that you added uh, talking about giving a birds eye view of different regulations different uh, <clears throat> acts and how the interplay between the le- different legal regimes is playing uh, now let us look at the legal position across the globe which varies across different countries so uh, firstly at the outset majority countries do consider them as legal in so far as they do not prohibit the purchase and sale of crypto assets and their use for purchase of goods or services uh, of course there are notable exceptions like uh, saudi arabia where virtual currencies face a ban uh, except el salvador as we discussed earlier nowhere it is recognized as a legal tender yet across the countries depending on the you know peculiar monetary and economic situations there are different types of bans or you can say regulations so some countries do impose a general ban then there is a list of countries which ban commercial trading platforms then we have some countries which ban their use as a means of payment then we have a batch of countries which restrict the financial sector uh, but let's see what in which bucket in which category of countries does india fall uh, so in india the uh, legal stand on cryptocurrencies has evolved over time uh, and i can divide this into three phases the first phase being the years 2013 to 2017 when india adopted a cautious approach uh, what do i mean by this so in the initial press releases of rbi uh, it cautioned the general public about cryptocurrencies and highlighted several risks such as fraud volatility potential usage in illicit activities uh, no underlying asset etc then in the year 2017 government constituted an interministerial committee and the year 2017 is very important because you will see that between 2013 and 2017 a lot of talk debate discussions started happening around cryptocurrencies so go and more and more people got involved pe- because of the rising prices people started investing so government acknowledged that it this is a sector which cannot be left untouched so government constituted an interministerial committee to study the various issues pertaining to virtual currencies and this imc was a high power committee because this, it consisted of participants from ministry of finance uh, ministry of electronics and it sebi rbi then they had the representatives from the ministry of corporate affairs and the central board of direct taxes also who participated in these meetings the second phase of years was 2018 to 2019 and in this phase india adopted a conservatory approach or rather a crackdown approach as some people like to call it uh and so anyone who is interested in the crypto field they would uh, i'm sure they would be aware that in the budget speech of 2018 the then finance minister said that the government does not consider cryptocurrencies to be legal tender and that it will take all measures to uh, eliminate the use of these crypto assets in fin- in financing illegitimate activities or as part of the payment system then came the famous april 2018 circular by rbi uh by which the rbi directed all its regulated entities basically banks to stop providing any services to or facilitating any entity or person dealing with cryptocurrencies this was a major setback for the crypto ecosystem in india then in 2019 what happened the high power uh, imc it issued its final report wherein it acknowledged that dlt in blockchain technology have wide applications in the financial sector but at the same time it recommended that all private cryptocurrencies should be banned in india and accordingly a uh, very important point that a draft bill was also prepared to provide that all cryptocurrencies except any official digital currency or cbdc which is issued by the government be banned and to criminalize the carrying on of activities which are connected with cryptocurrencies in ecosystem of course there are no prizes for guessing this was another major setback for this ecosystem in india then came the third phase and these are the years 2020 and onwards which saw some important positive developments so what happened in this 
Firstly, in the year 2020, the Honorable Supreme Court set aside the 2018 circular. And this was seen as a watershed moment for this field in India. Uh, of course, though the Supreme Court acknowledged that RBI had the power to regulate cryptocurrencies, it said that the 2018 circular was an arbitrary and disproportionate measure uh, because the RBI did not have any concrete data on whether cryptos had any adverse implications on the entities being regulated by it. So basically, in other words, uh, RBI's lack of concrete data to justify its action proved to be a negative point for them. Then earlier this year, another bill related to cryptocurrency was listed for being included in the budget session, but the same got deferred. So anyone who is interested in this field, if they uh, go back and look media reports around the time January before around the budget session, there were a lot of uh, articles which sort of uh, built on the speculation or they were reading that, okay, what will happen in the budget session? Will the government regulate it? Will the government ban it? But this, this, same, uh, this bill got deferred and it was never introduced. Then everyone expected that it will be introduced in the monsoon session. Uh, but again, in the index of bills for the monsoon session, it did not find any mention. Then you will remember that in March 2021, earlier this year, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs also came to the uh, came to this for uh, to this field, and it mandated that companies should disclose their own, uh, dealings in cryptocurrencies or virtual currencies in their balance sheets. Then at the latest point that is going on, the finance minister has stated that the cabinet approval is awaited for tabling the draft bill in the winter session, and much will depend on the fine print of this bill as to how it characterizes virtual currencies what it has in store for you know tax uh, tax points and how it deals with this overall system uh, how will it give an exit strategy to people so all those things will have to be weighted uh, for in the fine print of the bill now if we talk if we if we move to the next point what are the uh, the key features of cryptocurrencies and the underlying technology so the first point that we have to note is that there is no standard definition of cryptocurrencies while there is no standard de international definition, concepts like cryptography, digital representation of value, electronic tradability are some key elements. And that's that's why, you know, uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of jargon which is involved in this field. So we'll discuss the two key concepts, the distributed ledger technology that is DLT and cryptography. Now, so to understand DLT, that is distributed ledger technology, let's take a very basic example. The first is, let's take this example that there is a central bank which acts as the connecting point between all the banks. This means that uh, while the central bank has the ledger of all participant banks, the participant banks have access only to the details of their respective transactions with the central bank. They do not know what money has been lent or borrowed by any other bank with the central bank. What can this do? This can lead to a situation wherein uh, hypothetically a mischievous participant bank it can offer to lend money to another bank without being in ownership or possession of such funds in the first place. In contrast, in the DLT setup, since there is no central authority, each participant bank has access to the complete ledger of all interbank transactions. Uh, this ensures that no bank can lend the same money twice and that sol uh, solves the problem of double spending. Because if bank A offers to lend 100 rupees to bank B, Bank B can on its own check and satisfy that Bank A does have those 100 rupees to lend. As an analogy, if I have to give, uh, DLT com can be compared with a WhatsApp group chat or a Google Docs, where each participant has their own copy of the chat or document that gets updated on the real-time basis. Same thing can be applicable to this chat window that we have on the right side of our screen. Whenever any person is putting a message, the chat window is getting updated for every participant on a real time basis and these are some key features which are which are relevant for distributed ledger technology setup real time uh, updation of the information the second concept the second key technology in this field is cryptography now technically speaking cryptography converts plain text information into unintelligible text and vice versa by using tools and processes like uh, encryption decryption public key private key but what do we mean by this? Uh, I mean, on a daily basis, we do see these concepts being applied in our WhatsApp chats. To give a reference, uh, the number 100 cryptographic representation on your screen would look something like this. Uh, if you change just one digit and if you make it 101, the cryptographic representation changes completely. And this is the main security feature which acts as an anti-hack or anti-fraud mechanism. Now, please note that this is not the complete cryptographic representation. The full representation looks much longer than this and, and is hence hard to crack. Now, I mean, uh, one may ask, why is cryptography involved in cryptocurrencies? What purpose does it serve? So uh, in the beginning, what we learned that in this system, there is no central authority. 
and how will two people on this network uh, you know uh, trust each other well to build that element of trust between the people who are participating and using the dlt this concept of cryptography comes because in the system uh, since central authorities are not involved this type of a trust building mechanism is a must have for the cryptocurrency ecosystem another uh, example on a lighter note that i can give is the prescription by doctors so generally people say that doctor prescriptions are i mean they're not legible or they cannot be read by the normal person so what what happens in that it, when it when it is written and it goes to the pharmacy the patient becomes the carrier the patient is not able to read it so it is the the person is only the carrier he is not able to read what is written in that that's important because the message is uh, is is uh, i mean the message can be read by only the person who wrote it and by only the person who has to receive it any person in between can neither read it nor interpret it or nor do anything wrong with it and that's why it is called, that's why this trust building mechanism is important now this slide also demonstrates how the cryptography uh, te uh, technology will work in actual practice and how will it ensure that things will not get authenticated if details are tampered so if we see that there is a transaction of 100 dollars being given by bank a to bank b and there are different elements in this setup uh, this message is for 100 dollars you can see there are bank a and bank b's public key and there is a signature which is generated by this and that's a unique thing if any single element any particular element of this transaction is changed if a person wants to tamper with this and wants to make the amount 100 to 101 the signature will not match why because the signature was generated was related uh, related only to an amount of 100 dollars and not 101 dollars and that's the important feature of this technology that any 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 uh, attempt at tampering the data will not go through the next important technology now we move is the blockchain technology and that is a subset of dlt in which multiple transactions are stored in blocks and cryptographically linked to the previous block by chain now what do i mean by this uh, so how it works is that every time a new transaction take pl uh, takes place on the network it gets added to a block which records information about the transaction the block contains details like timestamp uh, date value who is the buyer who is the seller and a unique identification code then this block of information is is broadcasted to every participant on the ledger and stored in a distributed manner across various nodes of the network some participants who are called as miners and this is the important po point now how uh, what is bit, uh, cryptocurrency mining so some participants who are called as miners they verify the transactions using cryptographic methods and then the verified block gets added to the existing set or chain of blocks now since we had to learn about mining that's why we had to uh, understand the previous technologies like distributed ledger technology setup cryptography and then the natural extension the blockchain now if we see there is a now in the next slide we'll have a diagram on of lego games which infants play uh, that's the perfect anal uh, analogy for blockchain if a kid puts a block and then again puts a block on uh, a lego block on top of it the block which is lying below it it becomes immutable and cannot be changed so that's the i mean you can and you can take any example you can take an example of a building construction uh, when a second floor is constructed on the first floor the first floor becomes permanent and it cannot be changed same thing in the case of blockchain once uh, one block leads to the, another block of data the uh, the previous block cannot be changed because it is stored on every per, uh, person's network on every person's computer now why is how does it uh, why is it relevant in this how does cryptocurrency mining comes into picture since there is no central authority present in a blockchain or dlt setup of course some participants will have to come up and verify and validate the transactions that uh, that take place on the network because in a case of a banking system the bank people the bank system will uh, validate the transactions but in this system since there is no central authority some persons will have to come up and do that activity and why will they do that because the network incentivizes them by rewarding them with freshly minted tokens that is what is called as cryptocurrency mining uh, on this slide you will see how this technology will work in actual practice so there are two blocks of data uh, block 1 and block 2 uh, this both the blocks contain details of many transactions and both of them if you see the arrow on uh, on the bottom of your screen both of them are connected by a unique hash value now in block 2 if block if bank a wants to give say 10 dollars to bank b bank b can on its own check uh, with the previous block because of the unique public keys of bank a that whether bank a in fact had those 10 dollars or not so if you see in this example you can see that in the previous block bank a had got 15 dollars from bank d and therefore it can now lend 10 dollars to bank b 
so this is how this whole setup comes into picture and why and how uh, there is no possibility of immutation there is no possibility of uh, double spending etc now if we have to see what are the applications of blockchain technology it is being hailed as a revolutionary technology for financial transactions uh, global organizations like imf world bank are anticipating that it will reap huge benefits if i have to talk about numbers uh, by 2025 it is anticipated that 10% of global gdp will be stored on this uh, at an india level government india government is also uh, exploring the use of blockchain technology proactively in digital economy uh, some of the key areas in which this technology can have uh, revolutionary applications are uh, say immovable property uh, immovable property registries and title verification processes because there are a lot of procedural redundancies and inefficiencies in those processes currently another interesting area of use could be smart contracts in rent arrangements so for example the infrastructure of this technology can ensure that the door of the premise can get automatically locked if the tenant does not pay rent on time and that's an interesting thing simultaneously if the tenant pays rent on time then there is no there is no mechanism by which the landlord can stop the tenant from accessing the premise and these are these are just some of the interesting aspects in which uh, bct that is the blockchain technology can help but there are many things in which this technology can reap huge benefits with respect to mining as we explained in the previous slide the participants who on the network <clears throat> who undertake the activity of validating the transactions on the blockchain network are called as miners and this requires massive supercomputing powers and capabilities uh, it is said that in the earlier years people could do uh, mining by just using their personal laptops but now with the number of people on the network increasing multiple times of course because of the high valuations this activity has become very resource intensive and it and the it infrastructure for bitcoin and other virtual currencies have evolved over time so if i talk once again about numbers the latest hardware that is being used to mine bitcoin is around 50 million times faster and a million times more efficient in mining bitcoin than the cpus which were used in 2009 then we have a huge environmental cost which is attached to bitcoin mining uh, cryptocurrency mining generates enormous amounts of heat and in a uh, consumes massive electricity and that is why places which are energy surplus or where electricity is cheap or which have cold climates become preferred destinations to set up base for such mining Uh, Iceland is one such example. Uh, on the contrast, Ethereum, which is world's second largest virtual currency, it is said that uh, it, it it processes more than twice as many transactions as the Bitcoin network while using less than one third of the electricity. And that is one more reason why people are saying that Ethereum will be the leader in times to come. To see what really happens in mining, let's take the simple puzzle. So, if we are given to solve this equation, one sixty plus dash is equal to three hundred. Uh, and if we have to guess the missing input uh, i'll request people to put their answers in the chat box i know that this is very easy some uh, you may feel that why we are doing this but you'll you'll know in the next few seconds you'll know that why this is very important uh, if we have to guess the missing input i'm sure that everyone will be able to guess the correct uh, the correct answer why because there the, uh, the simple point is that addition and uh, subtraction are inverse functions so if you have to find the missing input from this algorithm you just apply the subtraction function what you do you just subtract 160 from 300 and then you get missing input as 140 but what happens in this equation or algorithm there is no straightforward way to solve this equation there can be multiple right answers and i'll once again request people to put in the chat box what what could be the missing input for this equation that if dash is equal to 1234 what could be the missing input because there are multiple right answers for this and this is i mean this is what uh, how cryptocurrency mining is uh, is difficult it could be uh, i mean let's have the exact the answers for this it could be 1 plus 1 2 3 3 or it could be 1 in 2 1 2 3 4 or it could be a total uh, text it could be a combination of alphanumeric text uh, code and that's the point here in the second equation we were not able to use any inverse function and that's what made the game difficult uh, to simply put that's what the algorithm which is used in bitcoin mining does basically every block of data has a unique hash value the miner has to guess that unique hash value the one who guesses the fastest wins the game and gets rewarded with the freshly minted token uh, on the screen you will see there is a 78 digit number because that is the possible number of guesses that uh, bitcoin's hashing algorithm has uh, if you have to be if you have to mine one bitcoin a day this is uh, 142000 tera hash per second should be your hash rate and tera is 120 so you can know that there are big numbers involved and uh, if if anyone is good in maths you'll know that the the probability automatically goes down and that's why uh, 
the probability of mining a uh, token is very low in today's setup. If we move to the next topic, that is the taxable events. Uh, so in the life cycle of a cryptocurrency, events can be bifurcated into two broad categories. The first category could be the events which lead to the creation of cryptocurrency, which can be subclassified into mining, uh, initial coin offerings or ICOs and airdrops. Now, mining is something that we discussed in the previous slides. ICO, that is initial coin offering, is uh, as an analogy, you can consider this to be primary infusion, which means issuing fresh cryptocurrency in consideration for cash or any other crypto token. This is not much prevalent now. The third category is airdrops, which means distributing new, uh, new cryptocurrency to famous personalities, celebrities, uh, influencers, so that more awareness is created about the new token. The second category of taxable events could be the events which lead to the disposal of cryptocurrencies. Now, in many countries, the tax treatment depends on taxpayer status also. So, for example, occasional trades or transactions made in personal gains capacity could give rise to capital gains tax liability and losses could be ring, uh, ring fenced to be set off against other capital gains. Uh, with respect to property taxes, the OECD report, which I referred in the earlier slides, notes that cryptocurrencies are likely to be subject to property taxation in countries that levy inheritance tax, uh, wealth tax or transfer taxes. But not much information is available on whether and how these taxes will apply to virtual currencies. So you'll know that in every field, there is there are a lot of gray areas, as Onkar was mentioning earlier, with respect to regulatory side, with respect to characterization side. And then from tax perspective, also, there are a lot of gray areas because there is no straight jacket formula. There is no one size fits all approach which can be applied for all crypto tokens. So that's how this field is evolving. And in, the, in times to come, we'll have more and more, much more clarity when it comes to crypto tokens. Now, with this background, I'll request my colleague Onkar to jump back again and throw some light on the GST implications in relation to cryptos. Onkar, over to you. Thanks, Raghav. So uh, coming straight to the GST treatment of all the transactions, which was mentioned in the earlier slide. Now, uh, the basic premise for treatment under GST is whether it qualifies as a goods or service. As we discussed earlier, it qualifies, as, may be treated as goods that also tangible, intangible goods and not as money or etc. Now, we should look at the definition of consideration. It says it is to include any payment made, whether in money or otherwise in respect of supply or goods or services. So definitely it is not money, as we saw uh, in, in the previous uh, segment. So it would get categorized under the clause otherwise. So it can, since it is goods and it is, it can be used for exchange for other goods or services. The entire transaction can be termed at barter and GST law recognizes barter. Now the problem with Treating the transactions occurring with our cryptocurrency as barter is that it might suffer dual taxation. One, when the GST may have to be borne by the customer for acquiring the cryptocurrency when you purchase cryptocurrency by uses of fiat. So at that point of time, there will be a GST impact. The second, when you use this cryptocurrency for further payment against you know purchase of goods or services, it will again give rise to a tax implication. So again, GST will be paid. This is the problem of this is a problem which transactions by way of crypto suffer. Similar problem also existed under the Australian law. And there was a Australian ruling which said that, yes, this transaction has to be treated as barter, as it would qualify as goods under even under the Australian GST law. However, post that, the entire issue was examined. And, uh, and then the Australia came up with a guidance note. The Australian tax office came up with a guidance note wherein they have said that sales and purchases of digital currency are not subject to GST. This means that you do not charge GST on the sales of digital currency. And similarly, you are not entitled to GST credits for purchases of digital currency. Basically, what under the Australia now has been done is that it has been treated as exempt supplies. Exempt supplies are something we understand in the context of Indian GST. However, similar concept has been applied there with respect to cryptocurrency transaction, which is not the case in India. Similar thing has been done in UK as well by the HMRC. Therefore, in the present form, uh, when, when we say transaction in cryptocurrency, it will be it might be treated as transaction in goods. Now, coming to a specific taxable events, mining. Now, when you mine a cryptocurrency, there can be two, two when you mine and sell it, it will be a sale of goods. Accordingly, GST will be applicable basis the place of supply. So, and secondly, if I engage you for mining, 
for performing a mining activity, I own the entire mining setup. Then you are providing a service to me. Accordingly, GST will be applicable on the mining activity. Second is initial coin offering. Here, the initial the token which you get during the initial coin offering, which you know provides you with the authority to gain a cryptocurrency post issuance of the cryptocurrency, may qualify as actionable claims, as you will have a benefit in a movable property in possession of someone else. Therefore, it might be treated as actionable claim. Therefore, no GST liability. Airdrop. It is mostly for carrying out advertisements, etc. So again, it is a property. So it will be treated as goods. So whenever there is an airdrop, it might be uh, that transaction might be liable to GST in terms of it being treated as goods. Wallets or exchange. Since they help you in trading of cryptocurrencies or trading of goods, they will be treated as service providers. And again, their services will be taxable at the, at the applicable rate under GST. Now, exchange for goods or services, as I have explained earlier, the cryptocurrency would qualify as consideration. The transaction will be treated as barter. It will it might suffer with dual taxation, as I have explained earlier. Now, I would like to hand over it to Raghav for taking you through the income tax treatment of the transactions or the taxable amounts. Thank you, Raghav. Thank you, Ankar. So when it comes to income tax treatment in India, firstly, the Indian government has so far not issued any guidance on how the tax treatment for cryptocurrencies will be. Uh, the IMC report also no, had no recommendations on the taxation aspect. Uh, there are no separate provisions in Income Tax Act which deal with cryptocurrencies. So thus, there has always been this debate in India whether the gains on cryptos will be taxable or not in the first place. And if they are taxable, then under what head? Should it be business income? Should it be capital gains? Should it be income from other sources? I know that there are a lot of tax people, uh, tax background people on this uh, discussion. So I'm sure they'll know that head of income is a very important point because different charging principles, uh, different valuation rules, different computation rules will come into picture for each head of income. Now, interestingly, when uh, government is being asked these questions in parliament, it has take, uh, maintained a consistent stand that depending upon the nature of holding, gains arising on transfer of crypto assets are taxable under the Income Tax Act. What this means that, again, your tax treatment will depend upon the nature of holding and hence business income versus capital gains tax classification will be relevant. Interestingly, the government has no data on crypto-related earnings of Indians uh, and hence in the absence of any scientific data with government on this aspect, it will be interesting if the government is able to issue any official guidance in the in times to come. Uh, of course, until that comes, it seems that the tax implications will need to be examined in light of the existing taxation principles only. So what we have done in this slide, we have tried to identify the possible Indian income tax implications for crypto tokens. For instance, when it comes to mining, uh, if the intention of the miner is to undertake it as a business activity, uh, of course, the same should be taxable as business income. Uh, in other cases, Section 56 implication will need to be assessed. And for this purpose, it will be relevant whether it can be classified as money or security. Uh, Section 56, as we all know, is a part of the residuary category of taxable incomes. Then uh, when it comes to ICOs, that is initial coin offerings, the most scientific basis could be to test the same taxation principles which are tested in case of primary issuance of shares. Uh, it seems that the conditions in the existing taxation provisions may not get met. But as we mentioned earlier, ICOs are something which are not prevalent now. Airdrops, that can be equated with consideration for brand promotion or brand awareness. And hence, the same is likely to be taxed as business income for the recipient. For the issuer, again, the question will be whether a deduction is allowed or whether you, can, you will say that this is an issuance of something, some token for non-cash consideration. When it comes to secondary sale, and this is the place where most of the normal investors will fall. The tax treatment will depend upon whether the same was acquired by way of mining or any other way. Because the key question in this uh, determination will be business income versus capital gains tax classification. Because if mining is undertaken as a business activity, then the gains on disposal are likely to be classified as business income. In such a case, the costs incurred on mining like electricity costs, computing costs, networking costs should be allowable as a business deduction. On the other hand, if mining is not undertaken as a business activity, then the relevant head could be capital gains. And in this case, uh, it, uh, the taxpayer will argue that, you know, capital gains tax should not be payable because the machinery provisions relating to computing the cost of acquisition are failing. On the other hand, the tax department will may want to flip the argument and say that, you know, the electricity costs, uh, the computing costs, the network costs, all those things will be the cost of acquisition. 
So in short, I think we can fairly say that the tug, uh, this tug of war between the taxpayers and tax department is likely to continue. When it comes to exchange for goods or services, and what do I mean by that? So today, if uh, I render any services and if the client wants to pay pay me in cryptocurrency token, or today if someone wants to buy a phone with a crypto token, so what will be the implication at that point? For the merchant or the service provider, I think uh, the same will be taxable as business income because the nature of payment cannot alter the nature of underlying transaction. The underlying transaction will remain as uh, sale of goods or provision of services. Uh, but for the purchaser or the recipient, uh, the gains which are earned in the value of crypto token, the notional gains, will uh, should be taxed in the same manner as secondary sale, what we discussed. So for example, if a person bought a token for $1,000 uh, around 10 years back, today if it is worth 20000 and the person using it to buy is using it to buy a product worth twenty thousand. So this gain of nineteen thousand, uh, ideally today is, could be the uh, date when the the gains are getting crystallized, and today could be the event uh, could be the taxable event. And the manner of taxability again in the same manner how we did the secondary sale. In addition to these income tax considerations, applicability of equalization levy, which is popularly known as Google tax, should also be assessed by foreign platforms beforehand. Uh, this is because the language of this new provision is very wide and uh, given that this is a new levy, there is not much interpretational guidance available on this aspect. Uh, similarly, the applicability of the new TDS provision on e-commerce operators may also need to be tested when an Indian resident is selling cryptos on a platform. Uh, again, the key factor here will be whether crypto tokens fall within the ambit of goods or services or digital products or money also. So in summary, as a concluding point, I think the key takeaway is that policymakers need to provide clear guidance for the characterization and the tax treatment for virtual currency and uh, virtual currencies and update them frequently. Uh, number two, there should be simplified rules on valuation and on exemption thresholds for small and occasional trades. Otherwise, the volatility in this field will just get fueled up and, you know, many innocent people will lose, uh, will end up losing big chunks of money. From an India perspective, what we note is that undoubtedly uh, the government needs to deal with, issue, with this issue openly and spell out in black and white its stand on the legality and the tax implications. Uh, some people are saying that, you know, this is the right time to make the most of this revolutionary blockchain technology and link it with India's, al India's already robust digital infrastructure. So, for example, Aadhaar has more than 40 million authentications per day. Uh, recently, in one particular month, UPI saw more than 2.8 billion transactions being processed. Whatever we say, uh, I think one thing is clear that it looks certain that uh, virtual currencies are here to stay. One cannot ignore them anymore. Uh, in fact, if it is regulated properly, it can boost the tax revenues of the government substantially, as we discussed in the earlier slides. Uh, then developments on the official digital rupee front should also be closely watched. Uh, from the perspective of consultants and lawyers and chartered accountants and any professional who's practicing in these fields, I think a basic understanding is a must have because this field is definitely going to grow. Uh, and with concepts like uh, non fungible tokens, which are NFTs coming up, I think a working, at least a working knowledge will, is definitely going to increase the horizon of the services which a person is uh, rendering. And last but not the least, I think from investors' perspective, anyone who is looking to invest in this field should ensure that he or she has a good knowledge about what. What is it that they are getting into? The purpose and the uses of the specific cryptocurrency which they are looking to invest. Because many, you know, everyone wants wanted to uh, uh, have the gains and the appreciation like a Bitcoin has done. But what the stakeholders in this field are saying that there is only one Bitcoin uh, and most of the other cryptocurrencies could end up being shit coins. So when a person is investing, he, should be, he or she should be aware of uh, what are the specific use cases and what is the potential for that. Because in this field, any uh, you know things can go for a toss any day in this field. So one has to be prepared for all those points. So uh, this is from our side. Uh, if there are any questions, we are happy to take them. Uh, Raghav ji, uh, there are few questions uh, from our uh, attendees. So uh, should I, uh, uh, you know, uh, Spell one by one, or uh, we can take it uh, directly from the chat box. So we can take them some of the questions which are marked. So one question is to treat it under capital gains. It does not. No. So if you want to, if you have to treat it as capital gains, I think the first point is you need it needs to fulfill the definition of capital asset. Of course, the definition of capital asset is very wide. It is property. So 
capital i mean but if the question is that to fall under capital gains does an asset need to necessarily be a capital asset i, I think the answer to that is yes the larger question will be whether it is a capital asset or not but since the definition is very wide uh, it could fall uh, regardless of the other characterizations then uh, in absence of clarity at present whether gain on sale of cryptocurrency should be offered to tax and if not offered so i think this is a very uh, so yes regardless of the characterization uh, tax taxes have to be levied and this is a state this is something this is a stand which the government has maintained from day one even if you re read any media report or government's answers in the in the parliament government is very clear on this point at least that these are taxable the only thing is under which head should a person offer it and i'll tell you the reason why a lot of people are having these questions now because most of these gains i mean there would be people who have earned gains on crypto tokens over the past 5 6 years also but most of that uh, crystallization or converting of crypto gains into fiat currency are happening now some people would have gained in the last financial year but a lot of people are gaining uh, making those gains in the current financial year when the values jumped up substantially so a lot of these questions will happen uh, a lot of this determination or these decision making things will happen when the people file the return for this financial year in the in the next year and i think by the time the people file the return for the last financial year also which dates are, have got extended hopefully the government should come up with more classic uh, clarification and if media reports are to be believed uh, the, in the new law in the new bill the government is going to come up with more and more clarity on the taxation bits also and i think from income tax and i uh, i last tonkar also to chip in in this that if the government is likely to come up with class, uh, clarification on the gst bits also tonkar you are on mute हेलो ओनकर यू आर ऑन म्यूट हाय सॉरी सो इवन फ्रॉम द जीएसटी एस्पेक्ट दी देयर द गवर्नमेंट माइंड कम आउट विद क्लेरिफिकेशन सो देयर हैज बीन न्यू सराउंडिंग दैट यू नो सीबीआईसी हैज गिवन सर्टेन प्रपोजल्स एस टू हाउ टू टैक्स द गुड्स हाउ टू लिव अ जीएसटी ऑन ट्रांजैक्शंस अकरिंग थ्रू क्रिप्टो करेंसीज बट मोस्ट ऑफ दीस सजेशंस देयर इज नो देयर इज नथिंग देयर इज नो डॉक्यूमेंटेशन इन ब्लैक एंड व्हाइट व्हिच हैज कम आउट however from the news which we have heard it is somewhat similar to uh, what i have stated in my slides so it's nothing in terms of, as to how it is being treated in australia so they are in the favor of imposing double taxation as i stated earlier so we'll have to wait and watch as to what kind of a, so mostly the, when this bills come comes across and how cryptocurrency gets defined under that bill that will also have implication on the gst treatment of the transactions understood and i think there is one the, a few comments have come on the supreme court judgment so i'll clarify those uh, those portions once again so you know the supreme in the supreme court judgment uh, the petitioners the crypto platforms and the crypto stakeholders their argument their contention was that this is not money and the context in which they said that this is not money is that that they say that since it is not money therefore uh, rbi does not have the power to regulate it because rbi's power to regulate comes only Uh, i mean the first condition for rbi's power to regulate is from the fact that something is money or currency but yeah. since it is and their contention was that since it is not money so therefore rbi should not have uh, uh, power to regulate it interestingly rbi also in its counter affidavits uh, sort of took a similar stand but the point of and of course uh, supreme court said that no it cannot be said that these crypto tokens can never be money or uh, uh, currency interestingly as if you read the new uh, if media reports are to be believed now there are some talks that in the new bill how the characterization will be the uh, the characterization may be depending on their use cases and the technology so i mean in this field also crypto tokens there are different types so one type of token is payment token then there are utility tokens then we have the security tokens uh, in the strict sense all the not generally heard cryptocurrency like which are used as a means of payment only like bitcoins they are they technically fall within the definition of a payment token so in the new bill it is likely that the government is going to bring i mean it is going to uh, characterize these tokens uh, basis their use cases and the underlying technology uh, some person one person is asking that do you think that there will be regulation at the exchange level too um, there could be because like st the recognized stock exchanges in india are there currently and they are heavily regulated which makes the uh, life of the investors easy it could be there that these kind of uh, 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 regulations uh, could come uh, there is one question about the security concern if 
so if in the terms of security concerns if, there, if the question is about the securities contract regulation act uh, the catch is that it is since it is not issued by a uh, body corporate and unless uh, the case of ico it may not fall within the ambit of security and as unka touched upon the different classifications different interplays uh, in that sense it may not be possible then how can nft i think on nft is also so uh, nfts are also the point for nft is the non fungible tokens one of the differentiation factor in those is that it is unlike crypto tokens which do not which generally do not have any uh, underlying asset in the case of nfts uh, there is an underlying asset so there could be an underlying digital art there could be a digital collectible there could be a tweet also uh, so anyone who is interested in the nft field they can go and see read that uh, one of the one of the tweets got sold for millions of dollars one of the digital art got sold for i think 69 million dollars so but there is something which there is an underlying asset attached to it and i and i know and i know that uh, onkar is also uh, willing to jump onto the nft bit because he you know because we in before that discussion also uh, we were discussing you know how nfts could end up getting doubly taxed but i'll uh, ask onkar also to touch upon the gst bits on the non fungible tokens Correct. So NFTs, since they are backed by assets, there are a lot of there are multiple legs of the transaction. The first leg would be to convert a particular digital or a physical asset into NFT. There, someone who is converting would provide a service. So that will be one leg of the transaction which might get taxed. Second is what do you do with the NFTs? So you will trade in those NFTs. So not only one physical asset is grand being transferred or a digital asset is being transferred, multiple parts of that digital asset is being transferred. So as many NFTs get sold, but into that. particular underlying asset so there are th- those number of transactions now how do you pay for those nfts is again a question do you pay it in fiat or do you pay it in cryptocurrency if you pay it in cryptocurrency again there is a dual taxation there so nfts comes come with a whole gamut of problem with them under taxation so these terms you know nfts be it cryptocurrency have to be defined very specifically under the bill or any other law which is being proposed to be formulated or under the existing laws the definition needs to be incorporated for them and a treatment need to be accorded to them to have certainty of tax otherwise the department will keep jumping from one place to the other and we would not know how ever at, as to how these are going to be taxed no, no, and uh, there is one question which i think comes again and again that how these cryptos derive their value and how they sink, uh, swing from million to billion so i think there is a for these type this question we have to go in the basics of economics number one uh, it's a demand and supply game anyone can uh, so whatever the stakeholder of crypto field crypto tokens always like to compare this with gold what is the intrinsic value of gold it is just i mean if today it is valuable it is selling at a high price because someone else is willing to pay for it tomorrow if the uh, government says that no gold is just banned completely it is going to be just a piece of stone or a piece of metal which people can throw away so the ultimate value of these kind of tokens lie uh, in the i mean the famous saying the value lies in the eyes of the beholder so therefore if one person is willing to buy other person is willing to sell of course the other intrinsic value is that for some of the cryptocurrencies uh, they do have business use cases also like uh, i mean of course without taking names that there are some cryptocurrencies which are uh, relevant for app developers because that particular blockchain technology it allows those app developers or content creators to participate in that network if they have a particular cryptocurrency if they have a particular token so of course for app developers for content developers for product developers if they want to participate in that ecosystem they do need to have this token and when they do need to have the token there is a demand for that token accordingly the value goes up but other than this there are i mean of course uh in markets also we know that if one thing is riding up then there are a lot of things which are riding up sometimes some things which do not even deserve those values so in this field also there are many things many tokens which may not deserve the valuations but other than that um uh, i mean other than that it is m- mostly a demand and supply game then there was one question which i uh, uh there was one more question that i saw uh I, on for it uh, foreign fiat currency also and that's a very imp- interesting question so as unkar touched upon the aspect of currency foreign currency see the concept foreign fiat there is a for foreign currency the first and the foremost point is that it has to meet the test of currency so foreign currency is that it is a currency but it is not an indian currency now when we go to the definition of currency under fema that is of course that's an 
inclusive definition but the question is whether a currency which is recognized by a foreign if whether something which is recognized as a legal tender by a foreign jurisdiction can you still call it as a currency under the indian in, uh, fema setup interestingly i think in the draft bill which was there this point was handled in a fashion that if there is a foreign currency then it may be regarded as a foreign digital currency so once again in the new bill which is like which is said that you know in the which is i mean reports are there that in the winter session it may be uh, tabled in that bill also it will be relevant to see how does government handle this but the point is very valid once it is recognized as a legal tender in a foreign jurisdiction uh the case is very high the, there is a merit in that argument that you should say that this is a foreign currency or maybe you can say a foreign digital currency but these implications could be there and why these are important because once you see the point is once you characterize them in any field or once you put them into any bucket they the other laws may have implications because like as, as we discussed on the gst bit also if it is a good if it is a money for gst then it goes out if it is money for income tax then you have a section 56 implication then you have a implication of interest also because i mean anything is interest only when the the thing or the asset which you have lent falls within the ambit of money so if i have lent a one crypto token to another person if the other person is and i know that many platforms are doing it if that other person is giving me some token whether that is interest or not will also depend on the point uh, on the fact that firstly what i gave to them is money or is something else so those sort of interplays and i think those sort of gray areas in interplay between the different laws and that's why you will see that the interministerial committee also had stakeholders from all these fields because any decision which is given today will have an implication on all the laws and the stakeholders from different places and since the value has increased so much in in such a less time the of undoubtedly and i think you'll have to give it to the regulators and the governments that the kind of legal issues which they are facing but i think in uh, times to come all those should be settled I think uh, there are some questions, but uh, because of in the interest of time, should we uh, not be able to take all of them? Take them offline if required. Yeah, we can take them offline if required. So I think this is then from our side. Uh, okay, thank you, Rangal ji and Ukar ji for taking out time and uh, being here today. Thanks for sharing your profound knowledge and practical experience with us. Uh, Thank you all participants for joining us in making this webinar interactive. The link to download the uh, PPT will be shared with all our participants over email. And for those who joined later on this webinar, can now uh, watch the same on Techspins YouTube channel. I once again thank all our panelists attendees. Uh, have a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Techspins team. Thank you, everyone.